as I was thinking about this this week, I, I, I thought, you know, there really are all different kinds of resets. And two of the major kinds of reset are what I'd call a regular reset and a radical reset. A regular reset is what all of us need, like, every week of our lives. We just, we just tend to drift as human beings. And because we drift, we got to get back on track. So we need a regular reset. Sometimes that can happen by being in church or in your small group or time with God in his word or time with journaling. There's a lot of ways to have that regular reset happen in our lives. There's other times when we need a radical reset, when everything has fallen apart and everything needs to change. And really this series is for both of those kinds of resets in our lives. If, if you want a picture of it, it's sort of like the old moon missions. At most of the moon missions, as they went to the moon, they had to have a regular reset because they could get a little bit off course. If they got off course, they had to get back on course. Reset, reset, reset. So Apollo 11, Apollo 12, regular resets. But then along came Apollo 13. And if you've seen the movie, you know they needed a radical reset because there was an explosion on the spacecraft. And so they had to reset the total goal of the mission from getting to the moon to just getting back home alive. So I'd say most of us, we're on Apollo 11. We're on Apollo 12. We need regular resets in our lives to keep on track with all that God wants for our lives. But some of you, if you're honest, you're on Apollo 13. I mean, Houston, we have a problem. That is you. That's what you're facing. And God is in the business. Even when that is what you're facing, God's in the business of helping you to find a reset. I have a verse at the beginning of your outline. If you haven't pulled it out now, go ahead and pull out that outline. And Psalm 145, verse 14, it's an encouraging promise from God. Because resets can be hard. They can even be wearying sometimes. So I wanted to start with this promise of encouragement. Psalm 145, 14 says, God gives a fresh start to those who are ready to quit. Now, what I love about this is that it reminds me of who gives the fresh starts. God is the one who gives fresh starts. God is the one who gives resets. So we are not talking this weekend about you by your own drive, your own energy, your own emotions causing a reset to happen in your life. We're talking about you looking to something that God alone can do. We're not talking about something you have to do on your own power. We're talking about something that God wants to do in your life through his power. And that's encouraging to me. Even if I feel like giving up through his power, God can cause a restart, a reset in my life. So this weekend, we're going to look at three major questions. The three major questions you and I have to ask ourselves in order for a reset to happen in our lives. And we're gonna learn these questions from a blind man by the name of Bartimaeus. Three questions you need for a reset. They, they're simple questions when you first look at them, but when you look deeper, you realize they really cause us to see ourselves for, who, for what God wants to do in our lives. So here's the first very simple question. Write this in with me. First, you ask yourself, where am I? That's what Bartimaeus teaches us to ask. Where am I? Look, look at the life of Bartimaeus. He's this blind man sitting by the road in a city called Jericho. And Jesus and his disciples are going to pass by. It's a pretty exciting day. Not only are Jesus and the disciples passing by, but it's during the time when all the people who are going up to Jerusalem once a year for the Passover celebration, from all over, they're going through. And Jericho was the town they had to go through on their way there. So, there's, so there's, all this excitement is going on. And in the middle of that, Mark chapter 10, verse 46, here's where Bartimaeus was. Then they, Jesus' disciples, reached Jericho. And as Jesus and his disciples left town, a large crowd followed him. A blind beggar named Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, was sitting beside the road. So where was Bartimaeus? He was sitting beside the road. He was sitting beside the road begging because as a blind man in that culture, the only way for him to survive was by begging. There was no other way. There was no job. There was nobody that was going to allow him to do any kind of work. The only way he could survive was by getting morsels of food from people as he sat by that road. Now, Bartimaeus, right away, you know there's something special about this guy. Jesus healed a lot of people of blindness. You can read about it in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. But the only one we know by name is Bartimaeus. All the other ones, we don't know their name. 
So there's something special that he has to teach us. And I guess, I mean, spoiler alert, let me let you know what's going to happen from the beginning. Because you already probably figured it out. I mean, it's Jesus. He's going to meet a blind man. Something good is probably going to happen. So let me, let me show you from the beginning what's going to happen. In Mark 10, 46, you have Bartimaeus sitting beside the road. It is by blindness. And then by Mark 10, 52, just a few verses later, he's following Jesus on the road. From beside the road to on the road. That is a reset. And this, this picture of Bartimaeus sitting there beside the road, it's a picture of being sidelined. Everything in his life that he dreamed of was sidelined. He's just beside the road. He's not doing any of the things he dreamed of because of his blindness. He's not living the life that he hoped for because he has to beg every day just to survive. And this picture of being sidelined, I think it's very helpful right now because a lot of us are feeling sidelined. There's a lot of people who, the dreams that you had, they haven't worked out like you wanted them to. The way that you thought life was gonna run, it hasn't happened like you wanted it to. And it may be because of the strange events of these last several years, or it may be just because of something else that I wouldn't know about, but you certainly are facing. And you're feeling very sidelined. You're feeling like you're not able to get on with what God has for your life. You need a reset. If you feel that way, exactly the reason we're doing this series is to look at how God can create a reset in our lives. And this, this reset of following Jesus on the road, Bartimaeus, in essence, is showing us how to get back on the road. And it all started, it all started with him recognizing where he was. And asking himself, is this where I have to stay? For, for Bartimaeus, it was like the, it was like the uh, you are here moment in his life. Looking at the map, and you get this you are here sign. In fact, let me put it up on the screen, what I'm talking about. Here's a map, and it says you are here. It says Saddleback Church. You actually are here. This is where you are. If you, if you aren't sure where you are, unless you look at the map and you see a you are here symbol, you don't know how to get where you want to be. And that's what Bartimaeus needed. And that's the question that's behind what all of us need to ask for a reset to happen in our lives. Where am I? To get to where you want to be, first, you have to know where you are. And to know where you are, you have to look at the map. And there's a lot of reasons we don't look at the map. One of the reasons is we, we just get too busy. We're just too much in a hurry. I, mean, I think we've all had the experience of, on, on, on Google Maps, we, we get in our car, we don't have time to look it up. We know the way there. We know exactly how to get there. So we don't take the 15 seconds to look it up, and then we get lost, and it takes us 15 minutes more to get there. And maybe I'm the only one who's had that experience, but, but some of us have had that experience just because we were too busy. Some, sometimes we don't look at the map. Well, if we talk about the map of our lives and what we're going through, sometimes we don't look because we're afraid. We don't really want to look at it because it's too hard to look at. There's, there's a lot of reasons we don't look at the map. But if you're going to have a reset in your life, you have to take the time to ask the honest question, where am I? And so here's Bar Bartimaeus, a blind man, teaching us the importance of taking the time to see where we are. Now, this question, where am I? You wonder how important this question is? It's actually the first question that God asks us in the Bible before any other question. Adam and Eve had a perfect relationship with God in the garden. In the, uh, in the garden. And in that perfection, they decided in their selfishness to eat of the fruit that God told them not to eat of. And because of that, they became afraid. They, be, they became afraid and they wanted to hide from God. And so God has a question for them. Genesis 3, 8 to 10, when the cool evening breezes were blowing, the man and his wife, Adam and Eve, heard the Lord God walking about in the garden. So they hid from the Lord among the trees. And then the Lord called to the man, where are you? There it is, first question we're asked. And he replied, I heard you walking in the garden, and so I hid. I was afraid because I was naked. And the reason he knew he was naked, the reason he was afraid, because he's eaten the fruit that God told him not to. And he has the knowledge of good and evil, and it's caused him to be afraid. And so God asks, where are you? Now, I think we all know, God didn't ask Adam, where are you? Because God didn't know where Adam was. God knows everything. God asked Adam, where are you? Because he wanted Adam to know where he was. And where was Adam? He was hiding. 
One of the major tip-offs that you need to reset in your life is right here in this story. When you are hiding, you know you need a reset. And there's a lot of ways we hide. We hide from our past through our denial. We hide from others through our distancing. We hide from ourselves through our distractions. We hide from God through our doubt. Now, th this is so important. I want to just slow down a minute here and look at this more closely. You know you need a reset when you find yourself hiding. So you ask yourself, where am I? Am I hiding from my past through my denial? I'm not willing to talk about it. I'm not willing for anybody else to talk about it. Then I need to ask, where am I? I need to stop hiding. Or am I hiding from others through my distancing? I'm just keeping other people out of my life right now. You have, you know what happens, you have this pity party thing where you just get all by yourself in a room, you pull down the shades, you make it dark, usually massive amounts of chocolate are involved somehow, and you have this distancing moment where you're keeping other people out of your life. You're, you're hiding. Or you hide, we hide from ourselves through our distractions. We just distract ourselves. We always have to be busy. We always have to be looking at some screen, doing something. Because we can't be quiet. Why? Because we're hiding. Or we hide from God through our doubts. Now, I, I believe God wants to honestly hear our doubts. And we all have doubts. And he will, he will talk to us about our doubts. But I also know that sometimes our doubts, they're not honest doubts. They're what I would call smokescreen doubts. It's just trying to keep God over there while I'm over here. Because I don't want to face it. I don't want to think about it. Once I recognize that I might be hiding, and I honestly ask the question in the midst of that, where am I? I am setting myself up for a reset. So I want to encourage you. Make it a regular habit to look at the map and just say, where am I in God's presence? In fact, you might write down, we're not going to take some time to look at this now, but just for when you do this, you might write down five specific areas to think about when you ask, where am I? You say, where am I? Physically, not just where am I living, but also am I going through some health stuff that I need to be honest about that I'm going through in my life? Where am I emotionally? What's going on with my emotions? Are they like they usually are? Have they changed? What's going on? Where am I relationally? Am I getting closer to people? Am I distancing myself more from people? Where am I vocationally? Do I feel fulfilled in what I'm doing? Am I doing the things that I believe God made me to do? Where am I spiritually? Do I feel connected to God? Do I feel closer to God or farther away from God than I ever have? So you just walk through those five areas, maybe sometime this next week, maybe every week, and you ask yourself, where am I? You look at the map. So by the way, what's the map? Where's the map? Where do you look to find out where you are? Well, you start by looking to God. You do this in relationship with him. We're not talking here about mere self-evaluation. We're talking about talking to God about where we are and what we're going through. So you, you talk to God and you say, God, show me where I am through your word, through your people, through your spirit within me. I, I want to encourage you to pray the reset prayer that Mylon and Kay taught us to pray this last week. Very important prayer for a reset in your life. Psalm 139, verses 23 and 24. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxious thoughts and see if there be any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. God, where am I? So that's the first question. That's where you start. And that leads us to the second question that Bartimaeus teaches us. First you ask, where am I? And then you ask, who am I listening to? Who is it that I'm, I'm listening to? Who you listen to what you listen to has powerful impact on the direction of your life. Look at what happened to Bartimaeus, Mark 10, 47 to 48. When Bartimaeus heard that Jesus of Nazareth was nearby, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Be quiet, many of the people yelled at him. But he only shouted louder, son of David, have mercy on me. So, so he's, get this picture. He is shouting out as Jesus is walking by, have mercy on me, Jesus. And the crowd is shouting at him, 
be quiet. Now, if you're shouting, be quiet, something's probably wrong. There's a little parenting tip in there somewhere, but that's another message, all right? If you're shouting, be quiet, doesn't seem quite right, but that's what's happening in this crowd. And Bartimaeus refuses to listen to the crowd. There is a lesson there. He refuses to listen to the crowd, and instead, he keeps shouting. And because he keeps shouting, Jesus notices him. And then look what happens next, Mark 10, 49. When Jesus heard him, he stopped and he said, tell him to come here. And so they called the blind man. Cheer up, they said. Come on, he's calling you. And so Bartimaeus threw aside his coat and he jumped up and he came to Jesus. So because he didn't listen to the crowd, he's in a place where he can listen to Jesus. <laughs> there is certainly something to hear there. Are you listening to the crowd or are you listening to Jesus? Because you cannot listen to both. There's never been a time when this question of whether I'm listening to the crowd or listening to Jesus is more important. Never a time. Because the crowd is so loud right now. You're carrying the crowd around in your pocket, in your phone. Every time you pull out your phone, the crowd has something to say to you, something to yell at you. You're looking at the crowd on your screens with somebody telling you something, how you should think, what you should think. There's never been a time when this is more important. Am I listening to the crowd or am I listening to Jesus? And if you want to hear Jesus above the shout of the crowd, it's good to know these four differences that we're going to look at now between the voice of Jesus and the voice of the crowd. First difference, the crowd shouts. Jesus whispers. If you're going to hear the voice of Jesus, you have to know that difference. The crowd shouts, Jesus whispers. The crowd is shouting at us all the time. Be quiet. Your voice doesn't need to be heard. Be angry. Be afraid. Be jealous. Be discontent. That's being shouted at us all day, every day right now. The crowd shouts, and the crowd is just going to keep on shouting. The Instagram crowd, the, the Facebook, Twitter, cable news, Discord, Snapchat, TikTok crowd is shouting at you. For some of you, it's the Pinterest crowd. God help you. It is the Pinterest crowd that you're listening to the shout of. But if you want to hear what Jesus has to say, you have to recognize that most of the time it comes in a whisper. And that means you have to get away from the crowd to hear the whisper of Jesus. To hear him whisper, I love you. I have a purpose for you. I will never fail you. I will be with you through this. We have to build new disciplines into our lives to get away from the shout of the crowd to hear the whisper of Jesus' love. The crowd shouts, Jesus whispers. Second difference, the crowd interrupts, Jesus invites. The crowd is an interrupting crowd. <laughs> Look at what happens here. They're yelling at Bartimaeus, and Jesus is saying, hey, tell, tell Bartimaeus to come here so that we can talk. He's inviting. The crowd says, quiet him. Jesus says, call him. Now, the truth is, you, you can't help but hear the crowd. They're always yelling. They're always interrupting. It's like that old knock-knock joke about the rude interrupting cow. If you don't know that joke, ask an eight-year-old. They'll be glad to tell you that joke. What we're faced with is the rude interrupting crowd. They're around us all the time. And whether it's a regular reset or a radical reset that you're looking for, it's only going to happen as you hear the invitation of Jesus to come close to him and listen to what he has to say to you because I promise you, he's inviting you. That's the depth of his love for every one of us. He's inviting you into that kind of a relationship with him. The crowd interrupts, Jesus invites. A third difference, the crowd waffles and Jesus never wavers. The crowd waffles, Jesus never wavers. Now, I, I, I gotta admit something here. I, I use the word waffle here just because I've never used it in 30 years at Saddleback, and I just wanted to use it, you know? I, I mean, I could have said equivocates, but who, what would be the fun of that? So it's waffles. The crowd waffles, but Jesus 
He never wavers. And wow, did this crowd waffle. Look at this crowd. First they say, be quiet. They're yelling at him, be quiet. And then the moment Jesus calls them over, they say, cheer up. Jesus is calling you. Like it was their idea in the first place. It wasn't their idea. They're just waffling. First they're against him and then they're for him. That's what this crowd did and that's what the crowd will do to you. First they'll be against you, then they'll be for you, then they'll be against you again. The crowd goes from shut up to cheer up in just a few minutes. And Jesus, he is, he's the exact opposite. He never wavers. His love for you, it will never waver. The truth that he tells you, he will never waver in telling you the whole truth. Now, there, there's one final fact about listening to Jesus or listening to the crowd. The crowd cares about itself. Jesus cares about you. The crowd cares about itself and Jesus cares about you. The crowd that day, they did not like Bartimaeus shouting at Jesus because it made them look bad. It was supposed to be a great day, a great day of celebration. And here's this blind guy over here, this beggar shouting, we don't even want to see you today, Bartimaeus. Could you be somewhere else? This is a day of celebration and you're ruining the show. We don't want you here. Plus, we want Jesus to be impressed with our city, Jericho. We don't want him to see that side of our city. So could you just be quiet? Because they cared about themselves and the way they looked. But not Jesus. Jesus didn't care about any of that. He cared about Bartimaeus, and he cares about you. Who, who are you listening to? I would encourage you to listen the most to the one who loves you the most, the one who cares about you the most, to listen to Jesus, to let the promise of his hope drown out the pressure of the crowd. Now, I wanted you, as we were walking through this story of Bartimaeus, someone in the Bible that Jesus caused a reset to happen in his life. I wanted to hear a story from her own church of a woman who, because she listened to the voice of Jesus instead of the voice of the crowd, because she had the courage to ask the question, where am I, was able to see a reset happen in her life. So would you watch on the screen this testimony, this encouraging story from Elisa Pack. Watch this with me. Until a year and a half ago, I managed to keep up the facade of my life wife to a Christian man, mom of three amazing kids, living in a well-manicured home in Orange County. On the outside, I was over-functioning as a super mom. On the inside, I had buried hurts, insecurities, and fears from my past. Over the years, I had formed unhealthy patterns as a coping mechanism and developed hang-ups into my adulthood that nearly destroyed my marriage. Growing up, the message in my family was to get good grades, go to the best schools, and marry someone with wealth and status. One parent has severe mood swings and anger issues. The other wasn't emotionally available. As a child, I lived in anxiety, walking on eggshells, and learned to perform. I felt afraid and never quite good enough. I strived for perfection, and if I fell short, I lied and hid to avoid punishment. I felt something was missing in my life in high school, and when I heard the message of God's unconditional love in Jesus' time dying for my sins, it immediately resonated with me. But even as a Christian, my insecurities and fears were still there. I didn't fully understand how much God loved me and how to live in that truth. I continued to try and earn validation, approval, and love from others, including from God. My home life worsened as I found escape from the instability by working and then going to college. During that time, I had an unhealthy relationship which I stayed in because of the attention and affection he gave me. I dreamed of one day meeting a Christian man who would love me unconditionally and start a loving family together. When I met my husband, he was leading worship at church and I was instantly attracted to him. He was funny, had charisma, and love for Jesus. He came from a loving family, but my mom didn't approve of him as he didn't come from wealth or status. We started dating, fell in love, and decided to get married against mom's threats. I felt alone and unloved as no one from my family attended my wedding. I buried the feelings, put on a mask, and walked down the aisle alone. 
We moved closer to my parents in hopes of rebuilding a relationship. My parents eventually came back into our lives, but criticism of my life and husband continued. The hurts and resents, resents, resentments kept growing, but not only towards my mom, also towards my husband. I was overwhelmed raising three kids, working full time and taking care of the finances and home. I didn't feel appreciated and instead of talking through the issues, I stayed quiet to avoid conflict. I found escape by overworking. I became good at compartmentalizing my life and staying busy to avoid my feelings. I started making choices that hurt my marriage and our family. Even though I was a Christian, my pattern of denial and escape kicked in. I felt like Paul in Romans 7, 19, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. If I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. I realized I was, pow I was powerless and I needed Christ back in my life. I asked for God's mercy and forgiveness. I confessed to God, but I kept my struggle from everyone out of fear. I decided I would go to my grave with my mistakes, but God had different plans for my life. During the pandemic, Pastor Rick was teaching a series and he spoke to me through James 5.16. God showed me that I needed to confess not just to him, but to others in order to heal. The words in order to heal stuck with me. Even though I had confessed to God, I wasn't finding healing because I had not confessed to others. That night, I felt God clearly speak to me, trust me and stop trying to control everything. Surrender the very last thing you're trying to control. Even though I was scared, God gave me the courage to confess to my small group. They showed me grace and love. With their support and prayers, I confessed to my husband, it was difficult to work through the shame, but even then, I felt God with me every step of the way. God led us to a counselor who happened to be a member of Saddleback Church, who gave me a safe place to speak my feelings. She helped me process my past hurts and traumas. For the first time in my life, I felt heard and understood. I continued to see God working in our lives. When my husband and I attended Celebrate Recovery for the first time, he shared with me how God was speaking to him. God has continued to show up and has been with me, encouraging me to fight for healing. Our small group has also been with us in support, prayers, and encouragement. 2020 was the beginning of my new life with Christ. I finally understand how to live in God's truth as a daughter of the King. I finally understand what it means to be cherished, honored, and valued. I am loved because of who God is, not because of my performance. The deepest need Jesus is meeting in my life is his unconditional love for me and freedom from my past. He knows me completely and still loves me unconditionally. I found freedom by looking to God for approval and not to other people. Lisa was talking about the very things that Bartimaeus went through. She talked about deciding not to hide anymore. She talked about, at the end, not listening to the voice of others, but listening to the voice of God. These are the questions you and I have to ask ourselves in order for a genuine reset to happen in our lives. Where am I? Who am I listening to? And then there's a third question. The simple question, what do I want? What, what do I want? And this... This might be the most important question for a reset. If you don't ask this question, you will stay stuck where you are. Jesus asked this question of Bartimaeus. What do you want me to do for you? Jesus asked. My rabbi, the blind man, said, I want to see. And Jesus said to him, go, for your faith has healed you. And instantly the man could see and he followed Jesus down the road. So the reset is complete. Bartimaeus has gone from being a blind man begging beside the road to a disciple following Jesus on that same road. 
And it ends up with this question, what do you want? And he says, I want to see. And immediately he could see. That's what happens when you have faith to tell God what you really want and trust him with it. But let's, let's confront the tough question here. What if what you want isn't what God wants for your life? I mean, obviously, God can't give all of us everything that we want. That would be chaos. I mean, the obvious illustration is sports. You got one person praying for this team, another person praying for this team. It would be chaos. But it's also true in marriage. There may have been somebody who wanted to marry you, but you didn't want to marry them. So if they wanted first, would you have had to marry them? Is that the way that would work? It's chaotic. Or there may have been somebody you wanted to marry, but right now, years later, you're thanking God for unanswered prayers that you didn't marry that person. Because what you thought you wanted at the time isn't what you really wanted. So there's something deeper here that we gotta look at. Because, because God doesn't always give us what we want like a vending machine, we all know he shouldn't do that. I think a lot of us have stopped thinking about asking this question. But I wanna tell you, this question, what do you want? Jesus often asked it of people, what do you want me to do for you? And honestly, confronting this question is one of the great keys to a reset in our lives. So let me show you something. Jesus asked this same question just before this, the very th thing that happened just before this with his disciples, James and John. He's talking to them. He asked the same question, and he gives a different answer. Look at what happened. God's trying to teach us something here. In Mark 10, what do you want me to do for you? He asked James and John. And they replied, let us sit at your right and, at the, other, and the other at your left in all your glory. So they went for it, the, the what do you want question. Jesus, we want to sit beside you on your throne for all eternity. That's what we want. And Jesus says, oh, you don't, you don't know what you're asking. Can you drink from the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism I'm baptized with? You don't know what you're asking. The cup that Jesus is talking about here is the cup of his suffering. He talks about it also in the Garden of Gethsemane. Those who sit on the thrones are those who have most suffered. So Jesus is saying, do you really want to be amongst those who have most suffered? Is that what you really want? He says to them. And then a little later he says, oh, and by the way, it's not mine to give. It's already been decided. Like, I'm not kicking somebody else off the throne because you happen to ask right now. God's already decided this one. So in this case, they have a request and Jesus says, you don't understand what you want. I need to help you. But also, the answer's got to be no. So sometimes when I tell God what I really want, the answer's no. Doesn't that, what does that mean? Does that mean I should just say, well, then God, whatever you want to do. If the answer's going to be no sometimes, you just do whatever you want to do. No. Not if you want to reset. Not if you want to live the life of faith that God has made you to live. You got to confront this question and honestly tell God what you really want. Recognizing it's not just to get what you want, it's also to understand what God wants for your life. There's a process that's going on here. So let's just look at how this works. What we want isn't always what we really want, what we think we want at least. And so we have to ask ourselves, because God's not a vending machine, how can I talk to him about what I want? And the only way I know to do it is to be honest to God about it. That's how a reset happens in your life. If you're feeling stuck, the way to get your life reset is to tell God honestly what you want. So God says, what do you want me to do for you? And in all honesty, your answer would be, I mean, if you're really honest, I want out of my marriage. It's so painful. I don't know what to do. I want out of my marriage. If you were really being honest, that's what you would say to God. Until you tell God what you really want, he can't work with what you really want. And so you tell him, God, this is what I really want. And by telling him that, you started a conversation and God can start talking to you and saying, you know, I might be able to work to bring help to your marriage. So that just, just possibly that thing that's the greatest pain in your life right now might become the greatest blessing 
in your life. And I know you're thinking, I know God's going to say something like that. That's why I'm not talking to him about it, because I don't want him to say something like that. Well, do you want to stay stuck in your misery? Do you want to stay stuck begging beside the road? Or do you want to reset? Do you want things to change? It starts by telling God what you really want. And I don't know exactly what answer he's going to give to you, but he's going to give you an answer. He might do what happened in the life of Bartimaeus, an immediate healing, an immediate answer. Or there might be a conversation that starts. What do you really want, he says to you. And you say, I want to be successful. I mean, if I'm honest, I want to be successful. And that starts the conversation. And God says, okay, you want to be successful for your own pride and your own ego? Or do you want to be successful to build up others and to bless other people? Because if it's for your own pride and ego, that's going to ruin your life. Pride goes before a fall every time. But if it's to build up others and to bless others, God says, I'm going to make of you a success that you cannot imagine. It might be bigger than you imagine. It might be smaller in this world's eyes than you imagine. But it'll have more of an impact on eternity than you could ever dream of. God wants to do that in your life. Or like Bartimaeus, God says, what do you really want? And you say, I want to be healed. I don't want to face this anymore. I don't want to face this pain, this difficulty. I want to be healed. And this one deserves a whole sermon. This one deserves a whole series to look at the truth about God's healing. But let me just say very briefly, when you, when you look at the blind people that Jesus healed, you find out that he healed differently. He healed Bartimaeus immediately. There are other people he healed them slowly over time. There are other people he asked them to do something to be a part of what he wanted to do in their healing. And then, not blind people, but others, there were some, and have been many, many down through the years who've asked for a healing, and it hasn't come on this earth. It hasn't come until we get to heaven when our bodies are made perfect. I don't know God's answer for you in this one. I do know that the people that I've asked for to be healed, sometimes I've seen them healed, and sometimes, more often, I've seen them not healed. But I know that in every case, when we bring that desire honestly to God, he can work with it. That's how the process works. You tell God what you want, and then, then he answers. And in his answer, you start to hear what he wants. And then you start, this miracle starts to happen where you start to make what God wants what you want. You get to a place where you can genuinely, honestly pray the prayer of Matthew 6.10. Your kingdom come, God. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I got to tell you, I don't immediately pray that prayer. It's a process for me. It's a process for all of us. And it starts by telling God what you really want right now. Whether it's the right thing to ask for or the wrong thing to ask for. Whether it feels selfish or it feels unselfish. You just tell him, God, here's what I really want. You want to reset? You want to get out of being stuck? That's one of the places that it starts. Listen, if Bartimaeus hadn't told Jesus what he really wanted, he wouldn't have been immediately healed. That miracle would not have happened. And there may, be, there may just be a miracle that God would do in your life if you just tell him what you really want in faith. And if James and John hadn't told Jesus what they really wanted, they would have never seen the selfishness of their request. They would have never grown closer to him by seeing that. So you tell him, this is what I want. These three questions that we learn from Bartimaeus, the once blind man, they're questions that help us to see. And as we start to come to a close, as we start to talk to God about these questions together in just a moment, I want to end with one more verse of encouragement to remind us that the, the love and the power of Jesus are right in the middle of all three of these questions. So at the beginning and at the end, I wanted to remind you, this isn't about us resetting our own lives. It's about God in his power renewing us, resetting us, doing something in us that we could never do in our own power. 1 Corinthians 1.30, everything we have, right thinking, right living, a clean slate, and a fresh start, they come from God by way of Jesus Christ. So let's end. Let's end in prayer for a few moments, just talking to God about these three questions. Would you pray with me? And just in this spirit of prayer, just ask these questions. In God's presence, say, where am I? Where am I right now? 
and start a conversation with God that might need to keep on going this next week, probably will. Ask yourself in prayer the question, who am I listening to? Am I listening to the crowd? Am I taking the time that I need to listen to the loving voice of Jesus? Who am I listening to? And then confront that question, what do I really want? Honest to God, what do I really want? God, here it is. Here it is. This is what I want. Our Father, we bring these questions to you in trust because we know that you are a God who loves us, who cares about us. You wanna work in our lives to reset us in the direction and the purpose, the love and the grace that you've made us for, a fulfilling life. Not a life without problems, but a life that's full of blessings because of your love for us. So God, I pray that you help us to ask the tough questions, but ask them in your presence and realize that you are there with us to give the answers, to give your direction. If you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, if you've never said, I need a fresh start from you, Jesus, just tell him right now, Jesus, I need your purpose in my life. I need your forgiveness in my life. I wanna follow you. Jesus, thank you for being with us in all things. In your name we pray, amen, amen.